and I am Megan Granado. I am the Sustainability and Resilience Manager for the town of Groton. And today I'm going to be doing a presentation called The Buzz on Invasives, Invasive Species and Their Impact on Pollinators. And this is actually the second run of a presentation I originally did on January 11th. And why I mentioned that is because if you were here on the 11th, you would have heard a really great introduction by Kristen Distante. Kristen is on the Town of Groton's Conservation Commission, and she is also the driving force behind Groton Pollinator Pathway. So um, she is the person who conceptualized this presentation and invited me to do it, and I'm so thankful for her. And so I wanted to give her a special shout out, um, and also just to thank the Pollinator Pathway group and the Town's Conservation Commission for their support. So this is the sort of brief agenda of what I'm going to go over in my presentation. I'm going to start with a little bit about my background in invasives and how I got to be talking to you about them this afternoon. And then not wanting to assume anyone's comfort level with these terms, we're going to go over very briefly what an invasive species is and what a pollinator is. I'll then segue into an overview of threats to pollinators. And from there, I'm going to review two research studies that I think were really um, helpful in understanding the, the dynamics between invasive species and pollinators. We'll talk a bit about research needs and then end with a review of a few locally found invasive plants that have very distinct impact on pollinators. And at the end of my slide deck, I have lists of references with links um, and Krista will be able to share the slides. So in case people are interested in learning more, they have a good starting point. So I mentioned my background because, in a way, invasive species are how I ended up here today. <laughs> I graduated from uh, Hamilton College in upstate New York with a degree in biology and a minor in environmental science and had no idea what I wanted to do with that education. So I ended up doing a Student Conservation Association internship with Richmond National Battlefield Park in Richmond, Virginia. And myself and another intern were detailed to their natural resource management specialist, and she had us out there doing everything from water quality sampling to deer population surveys. And we spent a lot of time on invasives, which is the first time I'd ever heard of this word and what it meant. So um, by the end, I was a registered technician in the state of Virginia for herbicide application. We did a lot of invasive species management. So one of those photos is me and my backpack sprayer. And we also did a mapping exercise to locate invasives across an 80 acre parcel of new park property that had just come online. And so I was so excited about this, I decided, welcome. Um, I wanted to go to graduate school for natural resource management and did so at North Carolina State University where I focused on invasives for my master's thesis. I studied invasive species and soil characteristics of riparian floodplains that had been restored in the North Carolina Piedmont. And so from there, I became a restoration ecologist out in California. Um, it was largely detailed to the development of a large scale solar facility out in the Carrizo Plain, which was a really fascinating change in landscape and also gave me the opportunity to think about invasive species and in a location that is entirely invaded. So that part of California had originally probably been dominated by native um, perennial bunch grasses, but with European colonization came the introduction of annual grasses and the grazing regimen that the European colonizers used really favored the annual invasive grasses and so they are what dominate the landscape today. So it's just a really interesting um, you know, setting to be in to think about being a restoration ecologist and how we were revegetating sites that were impacted and how we were mitigating sites with this in mind. And then I spent the last eight years working for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. By the time I left, I was the director of our Center for Restoration Finance, and we managed about $54 million a year of state and federal funding a lot of which went to the construction of water quality improvement projects like stream restorations and shoreline projects. And so we thought a lot about invasive species and how you manage them when you're doing large scale restoration. And um, when I wasn't tied to my desk, I like to escape and help with field projects. So that's a coworker standing next to some trees that we planted. 
on a mitigation site, and in that site, uh, my coworkers were constantly grappling with invasive species and trying to keep them at bay to help the trees become established and successful over time. So my position with the town of Groton is a new position in terms of the fact that I'm the first um, person whose sole focus is resiliency and sustainability, and so it's a really exciting position to be in. And I'm working on a number of um, initiatives related to climate adaptation and mitigation, trying to build new partnerships and ways to, to communicate about climate change. And I also manage the town's enrollment in the Sustainable Connecticut program. So we have been part of Sustainable CT since 2019. And it's a points-based program where um, there are a number of actions that you can complete and you have to meet a certain points threshold. And there's actually a number of actions related to invasive species, including educational events like this one. So from there, let's jump into the basics of invasives and pollinators. Um, I will start by saying that the focus of my presentation is invasive plants. There are tons of other invasives out there. There's the emerald ash borer, zebra mussels, all of those things. Um, but today we're just talking about plants. And I have a couple of definitions up there. The first one is essentially the federal government standard definition, which says that an invasive species, um, they have two main characteristics. The first is that they're non-native to where they are growing. And the second is that their existence in that ecosystem causes or is likely to cause harm to the economy, environment, or human health. So essentially, there's some place that they did not naturally evolve to be, and they are problematic. And we'll talk about why in a moment. California Invasive Plant Council defines them as plants that are not native to an environment, and once introduced, they establish, quickly repro reproduce, and spread, and could be harmful to the environment, economy, or human health. So a similar definition, but really highlights part of what's problematic about invasives, which is that they grow really aggressively. And the last definition I pulled is the Florida Invasive Species Councils, and they define invasives as a species that are non-native, again, were introduced by humans, either intentionally or unintentionally, and does or can cause environmental harm or harm to humans. So the unique aspect of that definition is the fact that humans were involved in the spread of the invasive. And I think that's an important piece of context, right? When we talk about invasive species, we're not talking about a plant that maybe normally was found in New York State and not Connecticut, but now with climate change is moving over. We're most are talking about uh, species that through globalization have been taken from one part of the earth to another. Um, more often than not, that introduction was intentional. There is some intentional spread through contamination of seed mixes, but there are a number of species that people introduced on purpose for one reason or another. So a good example is Russian olive, which was first introduced in the 1800s, but then in the wake of the Dust Bowl, the government actually subsidized people to plant it on their properties because it was so good at binding soil and so it stopped the threat of erosion. And also because it's a shrub and it's a very thick shrub, it was a really effective windbreak. So that's an example of the government actually like encouraging people to plant this shrub, not of course understanding the unintended consequence of that action. So I have just a handful of common invasives in Connecticut, um, purple loosestrife and Japanese honeysuckle, Japanese knotweed is in the middle, tree of heaven and mugwort. So again, I could have pulled any five from the list. Um, these are just a couple of common ones and it goes to show you that invasives come in all different growth forms. So there's invasive vines and trees and shrubs. Some are aquatic, some are non-aquatic. Um, and we talked in the previous slide about them essentially being problematic, and there's a number of reasons why. Invasives, as I mentioned, tend to have very aggressive growth forms. So some actually reproduce clonally, and others produce just abundant amounts of seeds. And so you have plants that have a propensity to just really be able to reproduce very effectively, 
And they've been taking it out of the environment in which they co-evolved with natural checks and balances. So a species maybe that was originally from China that evolved there, likely evolved with maybe insect species that ate its leaves and that helped keep the plants in check. So that insect isn't necessarily found in the United States. So when you move that species over, you're removing it from that system of checks and balances. And so you don't have the same um, kind of safeguards in place to keep its growth restrained. And when invasives take off, they physically displace native plants, often without providing the same ecosystem services and habitat benefits that the native plants provide. Um, they can change the physical structure of an ecosystem um, by essentially like removing an entire understory. There's some shrub species that they grow and they are so thick with foliage that they shade out the entire understory. And so you have a, a much simpler habitat structure that unfortunately isn't the same habitat as the native species provided when they were there. Some invasives like Tree of Heaven actually have what are called allelopathic properties. So they release chemicals into the soil that make it so that native plants cannot grow. They adjust the soil chemistry. So they have a number of ways of really kind of getting the upper hands on a landscape and um, in a way that increases their dominance and their likely dominance of that landscape. So in Connecticut, we have the Invasive Plants Council, and this was created through legislation in 2003. I have sort of a, a paraphrased bulleted list of, of what they do, but these are the folks that create the list of what is an invasive species in Connecticut. Um, they have very strict criteria that they use to evaluate species to see if they meet those characteristics and should be added to the list. Currently, the state list has about 97 species on it, half of which are deemed invasive, the other half are listed as potentially invasive. So those are the ones that people are very suspicious, very concerned about but are keeping an eye on because maybe they haven't checked all of the boxes to date. Connecticut also has the Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group, which is an ad hoc group that has a lot of great educational resources online. So they have the entire invasive species list, but then they also have links to fact sheets and photos and resources that will help you learn about that species, be able to identify it, figure out how to control it. Um, they do an annual symposia program, so they, um, you know, are really key in providing educational materials out to those who are interested throughout the state. With that, we're going to shift gears to talking about pollinators. So this is a little bit of a jump back to biology class. Uh, <laughs> the National Park Service definition of a pollinator is that it's anything that helps carry pollen from the male part of the flower, or the stamen, to the female part of a flower, called the stigma. And the movement of that pollen allows the flower to become fertilized, and thus it cre creates fruits or seeds or and young plants. So it's key to that reproductive cycle of the plant. The Pollinator Partnership website lists out a number of uh, organisms that can be pollinators, like birds, bats, bees, butterflies, beetles, and other small mammals. Um, this list is not exhaustive. There are other insects like ants can be pollinators. Um, but call out the fact that pollinators are responsible for bringing us one out of every three bites of food. I mean, that's how they, important they are to the reproduction of plants. And that largely is because not all, but the vast majority, between 75 and 95 percent of plants, rely on pollinators for pollination. So some species are wind pollinated, for example, but by and large, most species rely on pollinators. Which makes it all the more troubling and is why it's um, been in the news a lot the last recent years that pollinators are in decline. Their numbers are, are plummeting, um, species diversity is going way down. And so, as you can imagine, this is very concerning and very problematic. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website has a list of some of the main things that they believe are leading to pollinator decline. And unfortunately, invasive species play a role in all four 
So, and I don't believe these are in any particular order, um, but one of the key reasons pollinators are thought to be declining is because they have fewer places to feed and breed. So in other words, their habitat is being destroyed or degraded, which is something that often happens during invasive plant domination. Also, imported species, such as invasives, <laughs> and diseases impact pollinators. Pesticides can as well. Um, and I think, you know, thinking along those same lines, chemicals are a major way that we treat invasives. And so there's tons, and as you saw in photos, I've done it myself for a job, used uh, chemicals to help treat invasive species to keep them under control. And so every time we do that, we are adding those chemicals into the environment. And, um, where they might have a number of different impacts outside of the one we are intending to do. And then also climate change. Um, climate change is a constant stressor of plants. And unfortunately, invasive plants, because they are so hardy and they tend to be a bit more tolerant of different growing conditions, they're likely gonna be sort of like the winners of climate change. If anything, the stress that is gonna be caused by climate change on native plants is probably going to make it even easier for invasives to displace them. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the dynamics of how pollinators and plants interact before I talk about these research studies. And I like this resource I found because it, it narrows it down to like three main key points of that relationship. And I'll refer back to these when I talk about the research studies. So in order for there to be a relationship between a pollinator and a plant, first and foremost, the pollinator must recognize the plant as a host. Secondly, it must be able to physically use that plant as a resource. And then lastly, that resource must be profitable to the partner, right? It's gotta be giving up some food, um, for example, to make it a worthwhile interaction. So if all of those things are in place, a pollinator is probably going to be pretty jazzed about a plant as a, a host that they can use to meet some of their life cycle needs. So that comes into play when we read the research on the dynamics between pollinators and plants. And I'm going to go over, like I said, two studies out of a copious amount of studies online. And I will be the first to say, when Kristen asked me to do this presentation, this was something I had to research. So I'm still very much learning about it. Um, even though I had a background in invasives, thinking about how invasives impacted pollinators was not something I was an expert at by any means, but I really enjoyed getting to look into. Um, and so I pulled two studies that I thought had really um, helpful, like key takeaways and had a really a, a broader scale of the research. And the first is a study that was a meta-analysis of 40 different studies. So a meta-analysis combines a bunch of individual research studies that were done to be able to look at trend analyses across all of them. So it's kind of like a master study. And this particular one compared the impacts of what they call alien species, but invasive species, essentially species that were introduced, um, compared the impacts of those aliens on their native plant neighbors. So, okay, when you have invasives and you have natives coexisting, what are the impacts on pollinators' visitation to the native plants? And also, as a result, the ability of that native plant to continue successfully reproducing. And I have three really big takeaways from this assessment, um, but I wanted to share this direct quote because I think it wraps it up pretty well. They said, the results of this quantitative synthesis demonstrate for the first time that alien flowering plants overall compete with natives for pollination. Thus, in the presence of alien competitors, pollinator visitation as well as reproductive success of native plants tends to decline, which is a big mouthful. Right, so what they're saying essentially is, when you have invasives and natives growing together, pollinators do recognize the invasives as a host plant. And more so, they use the invasive as a host plant, likely successfully. Um, the study didn't specifically look at that. Um, and so really what they're saying is the presence of that invasive plant draws pollinators away from natives. I will say 
their result about reproductive success is a little bit more nuanced because although they did find a negative impact when they compared how one native plant compares another native plant, they also found a negative impact because plants compete against each other. Um, so that one's a little bit more nuanced, but I thought it was really insightful that they found that pollinator visitation is really impacted by the presence of invasives. So the three main takeaways I gleaned were that although they found this negative trend, it's really important that we not generalize because the impacts varied. And I was really taken by this when I started doing this research. I found a lot of research online that looked at specific invasive plants and their impacts on maybe one native plant, one pollinator. So, you know, scientists are really trying to get to the core of that relationship dynamic. They have a million variables to control for. And so there are a lot of studies that have looked really specifically at how a couple of species interact. Some of those studies found that the presence of invasives did have a negative impact on the natives. Others found the exact opposite, that the presence of the invasive actually brought more pollinators in because they produce copious amounts of flowers, the invasives that is, and that the native neighbors actually benefited because there were more people at the party. So it's really important that we not generalize, but I think that's why also on this previous slide, they said that the results demonstrate for the first time, because essentially what they're saying is there's been a multitude of these different studies. They studied 40 of them. And some of those studies have found contradictory results. But when you look across all 40, this is the trend we found. And this is why their results were really significant to our understanding of this topic. The second main takeaway is that it isn't just a numbers game. So when invasives and dominate a landscape, there is a ton. So this is a photo I took when I was doing research in North Carolina. Everything you see on the ground that's green is an invasive plant. It's called Microstegium. It's here too. So they were able to control for that and found that the trends of the invasives having this negative impact on pollinator visitation of native wasn't just because there were so many invasives that it swallowed up everything else, that when you were able, they were able to control for that, they found that same negative impact even when abundances were similar. So they kind of hypothesized that the invasives were better competitors on a per capita basis probably because they produced a ton of flowers, very large flowers, and that they were just kind of better competitors. The third, I think this is maybe the most important one, is that flower morphology matters. So flower morphology is this, the shape and the size of the flower. And color is also really important too, because pollinators also pick up on color cues. I mean, for example, that's why hummingbird feeders tend to be red because scientists know that hummingbirds are attracted to red flowers. So they mimic that in hummingbird feeders. So take, for example, this pink flower in the bottom right is a phlox. And a phlox has a very distinct flower shape. It has a very long skinny tube with a bunch of petals at top. It's called a salver form flower shape. That flower shape is perfect for a butterfly. Because a butterfly has a long proboscis, it can just unroll, stick into the bottom of that tube, and get the nectar, and doing so, knock some pollen around. The plant gets pollinated, the butterfly picks up some nectar, and it's a, it's a good mutual relationship. But a large bee is not going to be able to fit into that. So the shape and the size of a flower really determines that relationship it can have with a pollinator. And so what the scientists found in the study is that the more similar the flowers of the invading plants compared to the native, the stronger the invader was on a competitive basis, which makes sense, right? If you're this butterfly and you love a pink salver form flower and all of a sudden someone else shows up who also has a pink salver form flower, you could see how all of a sudden maybe that butterfly says, oh, this plant looks good too. Or maybe it doesn't even distinguish the differences between the plants. And so in those cases where you have that tight similarity, the invader is able to more effectively take the attention of the pollinators away from the native. So the authors here talked about some management implications with this, and they suggested that 
when doing invasive management, because most of our sites are so highly invaded, you really have to pick and choose your battles and triage your resources to what's most important. They suggested that when people are making those decisions, maybe they consider the similarity between the flower structure of the invasives and the existing natives and prioritize treating the invasives that have that close similarity to natives they're trying to protect. The second study that I want to go over talked, uh, looked at 12 invasive plants across Hungary and Romania, and they looked at three types of pollinators, wild bees, honeybees, and hoverflies. And they actually studied sites that were invaded versus sites that were non-invaded, and it's amazing that they were able to find sites that were not invaded, <laughs> um, but they did. And so they made some comparisons. Again, when you have a, a community in which you have an invasive growing amongst natives, how do, what are the dynamics of pollination there versus when you have an ecosystem where you don't have the invasion? So they first found out that, not surprisingly, the sites that were invaded had lower abundance and diversity of native flowering plants, i.e. the invasives had nudged out the natives pretty effectively. They interestingly also found that those sites, before the invasive bloomed, didn't have that many pollinators around. So compared to the sites that had only natives, where you probably had better species richness and diversity, and so a lot of different plants drawing in different pollinators, the invaded sites, because they had less complexity in terms of the number of species there, there weren't as many pollinators. All of that changed when the invasives bloomed. So when the invasives bloomed, all of a time there were a ton of pollinators and different types of pollinators. Um, and so essentially it harkens back again to that first tenant of the relationship. When invasives are present, yes, pollinators are attracted to them. They do use them as a host. However, they found that the impacts are species specific. And they said, given the wide array of pollinators, ranging from birds to bats to bees and hoverflies, it's unlikely to find a consistent overall response. And that makes sense, again, what we talked about with the previous slide. Not all pollinators interact with the same plants. Um, physically, not all of them are able to interact in the same way. And so you really, similar to the, the previous study where that pointed out impacts varied, same thing here is that you can't make generalizations, that it has to be more nuanced than that. However, they did find that um, perennials, perennial invasives, which we have a ton of, uh, had a stronger impact. They also were able to discern that hoverflies, which are generalists, were kind of like the big winners in all of this. So generalists are species that can use a number of different plants to meet their resource needs. So a hoverfly might be able to visit know, 15 different species of plants in order to gain its nectar. In comparison, um, specialists, which um, wild bees are usually specialists, they are reliant on maybe one or two species. So you can, you can imagine in invaded sites, the specialist is really gonna struggle because if the native plant or plants they rely on are knocked out, all of a sudden their food source is entirely gone. They don't have the flexible behavior to be able to all of a sudden start using the invasive in its, plant, in its place. Um, and so it makes you think a lot about how different pollinator species are impacted by this whole dynamic. And they also, the authors, stress the fact that impacts are both direct and indirect. So they pointed out that, that although invasives might during one part of the season provide a ton of food for pollinators, they might be indirectly harming the pollinators in other times of the season by having outcompeted the plants they rely on, maybe for where they lay their eggs and other resource needs. Um, and that invasives are probably creating sort of like a boom and bust cycle where when they're blooming, there's tons of resources, but then that's that when they're done blooming. Um, so their management recommendation was that restoration efforts should consider at a species level the timing of the resources being developed. This one I struggle with a little bit more as someone who used to have to plan invasive species removal because generally you wanted to remove the invasives before they even flowered because some plants, once they flower, 
if they're already fertilized, if you cut them, the seeds will still ripen, in which case you're actually just doing them a favor because now you have all of that material with the ripening seeds on the floor, on the ground, seed to soil contact, you're actually improving the odds that the seeds are going to successfully grow. Um, but good food for thought, regardless. So across the board, all of the studies I read talked about a ton of future resource needs um, and the growing field that's really necessary to understand these dynamics. A lot of people call for community level analyses that it's great to know what's happening between these certain species, but don't want to miss the forest for the trees, right? There's so much more to learn about. Um, and multi-species interactions and how all of these dynamics kind of ripple out their impacts across an ecosystem is really important for us to understand. Something else that was really important to point out is that, you know, when Kristen asked me to do this presentation, I was looking for research backing up the impact of the plants on the pollinator. Most of the research doesn't make that direct connection. It tells you about the impact of the invasive on the native host plant, but that more research is really needed on the direct impact of the invasive species on the pollinator. And also that there needs to be more of a consideration of life cycle needs, which we're going to talk about in just a moment here. So I'm going to close the presentation with a few examples of species that grow in Connecticut that do have very discrete impacts on pollinators. Um, the first is black swallow warts. So this plant is in the same family as milkweed. So just like milkweed has some toxins in its leaves that keep it from um, being so tasty to things that might eat it, black swallow wart does as well. Unfortunately, either the toxins aren't the same or the level of the toxins aren't the same. So whereas monarch butterfly eggs and caterpillars survive on milkweed, they don't survive on black swallow warts. And it's been documented that monarchs, however, even when the two species are growing in the same area, monarchs will sometimes lay their eggs on black swallowwort, in which case they don't survive. There's a very similar story with garlic mustard and its impact on native toothworts. Garlic mustard is extremely aggressive and um, very effectively has outcompeted a number of native plants, including native toothworts. Native toothworts are a host of a rare butterfly called the West Virginia whites. And again, because they're related, the West Virginia white butterfly will sometimes lay its eggs on garlic mustard leaves, but the leaves are actually toxic to the eggs and caterpillars and they don't survive. So these were some clear examples of the fact that you have invasives that when they're present, not only are they influencing the, the pollinator's decision pathway in terms of where to lay its eggs, where to invest those resources, but then also directly impeding the successful reproduction of that species as a result. I'm going to end on a little bit of a controversial note, if you can have controversy in this field, um, which is butterfly bush. So butterfly bush is not on the Connecticut invasive species list. I will say that twice. Butterfly bush is not currently on the Connecticut invasive species list. Um, it is listed as a noxious weed in two states on the West Coast. And it's one that people are kind of wary of because it has been documented to escape cultivation. So actually when I did this presentation on the 11th, a gentleman in the audience said he knows of places in Groton where it has escaped to. Um, so natural areas where now there's butterfly bush growing. So why I bring a butterfly bush is that it's a really popular plant. And for good reason, they're beautiful and they attract copious amounts of butterflies and it's lovely to on a summer afternoon be watching butterfly bushes, you know, with all of the, all of the butterflies on it. Um, and it does provide just a, a ton of resource to the butterflies. There had been some talk years ago about its nectar being like junk food. It, that's not actually true. They analyzed the, um, the nutrient components of the nectar and found it's actually similar to native plants. But the reason I bring it up is because of life cycle considerations. So although butterfly bush provides a ton of food out to pollinators, it can only support like the eggs and caterpillars and other life cycle needs of one or two species. 
So when you compare it then to a native plant that provides food as well as the other life cycle supports, you know, there's just, there's some trade-offs there. And I think that those are things that are important to keep in mind when people are making species selections for their own properties. And with that, like I said, I have a, a couple of slides just of the resources I use when doing the research for this presentation and the scientific papers. And that concludes the presentation.